Hello and welcome to Verified Live. Israel says its troops in Gaza are engaged in face-to-face -face combat with fighters from Hamas. The Israeli military says its troops have now completely encircled Gaza City in the north of the territory, almost four weeks since the start of this war. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has been back in Tel Aviv as Washington increases the pressure for a humanitarian pause. Anthony Blinken talked about Israel's right to defend itself, but also the need for concrete steps to minimize harm to civilians in Gaza. Meanwhile, the leader of Hezbollah, like Hamas, a prescribed terror organization, has spoken in Lebanon. Hassan Nasrallah praised the Hamas attacks and said the possibility of total war is realistic. One other important line to update you on, more foreign nationals have been getting out of Gaza at the Rafa crossing point into Egypt. 124 British nationals are on the list of people who are being allowed to leave. Well, the Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza says more than 9,000 people have been killed in the Strip since October the 7th, after Hamas killed 1,400 people in the attacks in southern Israel. Well, we'll be covering all the latest developments here with my colleague, the BBC's chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, and she joins us from Jerusalem. Lise, over to you. Yes, and welcome back to Jerusalem. We had a few hours ago a split-screen moment here across the region with the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, addressing the press after his meetings with Israeli leaders, emphasizing how much the United States would do to assist in easing the suffering of Palestinians and working, he said, with the U.S.'s partners in the region to avoid an escalation. At the same time, the Lebanese leader, Hassan Nasrallah, making his first public speech since the war began after October the 7th, blaming the United States for what he said, the crimes of the Gaza war, and as we've just heard, warning of the possibility of an all-out war. Well, let's look at those two top stories, starting with Anthony Blinken. He spoke to the press after he met the Israeli president, Isaac Herzog. He reaffirmed his solidarity with Israel, but he also mentioned his hopes for what is being described as a, a pause, a humanitarian pause in the fighting. That was an important area of discussion today with uh, Israeli leaders. How, when and where uh, these can be implemented, what work needs to happen, and what understandings must be reached. Now we recognize this would take time to prepare and coordinate as well with international partners. A number of legitimate questions were raised uh, in our discussions today, including how to use any period of pause to maximize the flow of humanitarian assistance, how to connect a pause to the release of hostages, how to ensure that Hamas doesn't use these pauses or arrangements to its own advantage. These are issues that we need to tackle urgently, and we believe they can be solved. We've agreed to have our teams continue to discuss practical solutions. I've instructed uh, our special envoy for Middle East humanitarian issues, David Satterfield, uh, who's been doing remarkable work here over the last couple of weeks, to continue these discussions. Uh, ultimately, we believe this can be a critical mechanism for protecting civilians while enabling Israel to achieve its objectives of defeating Hamas. Anthony Blinken emphasizing those issues of humanitarian aid, a possible pause. Those are issues which matter to Arab leaders across the region. And now that his talks uh, in Israel have, have finished, the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is heading to Jordan, where he will meet the Jordanian foreign minister. Jordan, of course, has already pulled its ambassador from Israel. Well, let's look at the other top speech this hour by the leader of the Iranian-backed Lebanese group Hezbollah. He delivered Hassan Nasrallah his first public speech in secret since the beginning of the Israel-Gaza war. It was a speech that was widely anticipated and quite a lot of concern that if his, in, that his address could inflame passions and fuel a, be a catalyst for a wider conflict. Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah said, among his, in his 90-minute speech, said the attack by Hamas, which, like Hezbollah, is a designated terror group by the British and American governments, was, in his words, right, wise and courageous and at the right time. But he emphasized that the battle was 100 percent 
Palestinian and it was for the Palestinian people and did not relate to any regional issues. In effect, saying that uh, pushing back against uh, accusations that Iran, Hezbollah's closest ally, was behind uh, what happened in Gaza. But the Hezbollah leader did warn of the possibility that a possibility of all-out war was, in his words, realistic. We didn't broadcast that speech live, but we can bring you an excerpt. Let's take a listen. This is the first operation, which has been a historic point and, and blessed point. This was a Palestinian decision, 100 Per, uh, 100 percent and supported by the Palestinians, 100 percent. Hassan Nasrallah and across Lebanon today, massive screens were set up for public viewing. Many, many would have watched that speech there. Let's go to southern Lebanon to join our Middle East correspondent, Hugo Bachega. Hugo, I'm not sure whether you've had a chance to speak uh, to people in Lebanon, what they made of this widely anticipated speech by Hassan Nasrallah. And the, the general assessment seems to be he didn't go as far as many feared he would. Yeah, I think, uh, Liz, lots of people are relieved here in Lebanon tonight. So I'm here in Beirut. I was at one of those screenings that had been organized by Hezbollah, uh, a screening uh, in a southern suburb of Beirut, which was a which is a, a stronghold of the group. And I think uh, there have been these concerns that uh, this, uh, this violence along the Lebanon-Israel border could escalate and Lebanon could be dragged into this conflict. So I think to give you some other lines of what uh, Hassan has had to say. He said that all options are on the table. He also said that the only way to prevent a regional conflict is to stop the war in Gaza. But again, we didn't have any kind of indication, any announcement that uh, Hezbollah is preparing a major escalation in this conflict, which is perhaps, you know, positive news given the recent fighting that has been happening along this border. But again, I think he left open the possibility that Habas, uh, Hezbollah, could escalate uh, its attacks against uh, Israel. He said that this would depend on the situation in Gaza and also how uh, Israel responds to what Hezbollah has been doing. But again, uh, before this uh, speech, uh, there was a lot of you know uh, concern here that Hezbollah could uh, be planning an escalation uh, of, of those cross-border attacks that we've seen over the last few weeks uh, since this Israel-Hamas war started. But today, after this much-anticipated speech, we haven't had any uh, announcement that Hezbollah is, prepared to, uh, is preparing to uh, escalate the situation along the border. That must come as a huge relief to the people of Lebanon, as we've been reporting now almost since this war began, that they're mindful of how much they suffered in the last Lebanon-Israel war in 2006. So much uh, even in Beirut was destroyed. And Hezbollah uh, did, did, did suffer enormously too, even though Hassan Nasrallah mocked the United States and said, you're saying you're, you're going to destroy Hamas now. Well, you said in 2006 you're going to destroy Hezbollah, and here we are. Exactly. And over the last few weeks, uh, I've spent a lot of time, you know, traveling along the border, visiting some villages, some of those villages that have been hit by those Israeli uh, strikes uh, in response to those Hezbollah attacks. So lots of people still remember the devastation brought by the 2006 war. But Lise, I think, you know, we've got to say that Hezbollah is now a much stronger force than it was in 2006. It has uh, an estimated 150,000 rockets, including precision-guided missiles that can strike deep inside Israeli territory. It also has tens of thousands of fighters, many of them who fought in the civil war in Syria. So it is considered by Israel a much more formidable force than, than Hamas. So that's why I think uh, there have been these concerns from the Israelis, from the Americans, many others, that uh, the situation here could escalate and this could become another front in the conflict. I think what was also interesting in this uh, speech by Hassan Nasrallah was that he said the group wouldn't be intimidated by those warnings from the Americans, from the Israelis, uh, and that uh, the group would also wouldn't be intimidated by those fleets, uh, th those uh, um, 
um, uh, ships that have been warships that have been sent by the Americans to the region. So again, uh, I think what Hezbollah is trying to do is to say that the situation can change. But today we haven't had that announcement that Hezbollah is planning a major escalation of the situation here. Hugo Bichega, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Yes, Hassan Nasrallah, a lot of defiant rhetoric against the United States, even using the phrase that has been used in Iran since the Iranian Revolution of 1979, that the United States is the, the great Satan. Let's get a bit more analysis of what the head of the Lebanese Islamist group had to say. A short time ago, I spoke to our security correspondent, Frank Gardner, uh, to ask about the statements emphasized by Hezbollah that the attacks carried out by Hamas in southern Israel on October the 7th were 100 percent Palestinian. They know because it's been made very clear to them, both by Israel and the United States, that if Hezbollah gets involved, if it embarks on a full-scale war with Israel, which would be hugely damaging for Israel, it would be devastating for Lebanon. And Hezbollah is not just a, the most powerful military force in Lebanon. It's not just an Iranian-allied and, and backed uh, militia. It's a very... Um, it's a vital part of the Lebanese political scene. And a lot of Lebanese have been saying, please don't do this. Lebanon's economy is already in crisis. It, it pretty much collapsed four years ago. It's not in a good state. And Israel has made it very clear that if there is a full-scale war, the moment there's a kind of low-grade skirmishing taking place on that border between Lebanon and Israel, that northern border of Israel, there are casualties on both sides. There's exchanges of fire. But it's limited. It's calibrated. It's, it's been carefully calibrated by Hezbollah to show their support for Hamas, but not to provoke Israel so much that they get a devastating response in return. But reading into that speech, I think the big subtext, the word that was missing that I didn't see, maybe you did, Iran. They're at great pains to say this Hamas attack on October the 7th, which they praised, which has been condemned by much of the world, certainly most of the Western world, but also by leaders such as in the UAE, um, they've made it clear that was a Palestinian operation. In other words, Iran wasn't behind it. There was a big suspicion in Israel and some other places that Iran had somehow given it its blessing and its backing. Iran has said, no, we, we approve of it, but we didn't do it. Yes, very interesting using this phrase that the Hamas attacks of October the 7th, which, of course, in his vocabulary, describing them as as glorious, a seismic earthquake, as he put it, was 100 percent Palestinian. But also, Frank, not just saying that this wasn't the doing of Iran, but saying that groups like Hezbollah, like the militias in Iraq and Syria and Yemen, also had their own leadership, that this was simply not the doings of Iran to say, don't don't, don't make it look as though we are the puppets of Iran, which, of course, has been part of the, of the d d dialogue surrounding this war, this concern that Iran will, in effect, turn the tap on with this so-called arc of resistance. Yeah, I, I don't think many people will buy that, um, the disassociation of Iran from this, because Iran has been very heavily involved in spreading partly through its Quds Force, which is part of the Isla Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps. It's the external operation arm of the Revolutionary Guards, the Pastoran. It has been very effective in spreading its, its military influence right across the Middle East. Um, so in Iraq, it's got what's called the popular... And when, they, when Arabs use the word popular, the actual Arabic word is sha'abi, which means peoples, rather than popular as in beloved. So the Popular Mobilization Forces is an Iranian-allied militia in Iraq. Um, there is them, there is Hezbollah in Lebanon, there are other groups in Syria. And then, of course, there's the Houthis in Yemen, who have recently been firing missiles towards Israel. They've all been shot down either by Israeli or U.S. warships. But there is... This is when people talk about regional escalation. There is the fear that various fires could be lit, perhaps fanned and encouraged from Tehran, but hard to actually trace their hand in it directly, um, that is surrounding Israel. Now, the big fear here is that if Hezbollah, and this is why this speech today was so important, I'm not seeing anything in it that says we're about to go to war. So there's, a, I think, a little bit of a relief there. Um, but if Hezbollah was to fully join in a war 
together with Hamas, Israel would find itself fighting a war on two fronts. And quite possibly when the U.S. says to Israel, we've got your back, that would mean the involvement of U.S. warships offshore in the Mediterranean, probably using some of their firepower to, to, to hit Hezbollah. Analysis of that first Hassan Nasrallah speech by our security correspondent around the world and across the United Kingdom. You're watching BBC News.